speaking to me. You've got a very different, you've got a man with no equipment and just a white wall and a man with all the equipment you'd ever need. I think he's been down for 10 years as, as uh, Chopper Soros to show you up, I think, now, Jake. So it's just, it just shows the different types of personality you're dealing with here. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, but you're just a recently married man. You can get away with it now. Yeah? <laughs> Congratulations on, on getting married, by the way. I hope it all went well. It looked like you did from the photo, so yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Thank you. Yes, absolutely uh -huh, fantastic. Uh -huh, fantastic. So, so, uh, so you, I think you said to me the other day, um, Chopper Soros turns 10, 10 this year? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to start off a little bit with that. I mean, how did that come about? Because I know that you worked together previously, but how did, how did that come about? Was that specifically to write music for, for films or was that just something completely different? Yeah, I mean, it was... Um, I think Nick and I just have always shared a love of, I guess, pop music and film. And obviously that's always been echoed in my band, My Life Story. Um, and yeah, I mean, we just had a... We had, we had a love of those things and um, yeah, we just felt that it was like a natural progression to start moving into, you know, the, the sort of world of the moving image. Uh -huh. So it was, a, was it, was it kind of just something that you fell into? I mean, like I remember uh, Clint Mansell, for example, he just kind of fell into it. Was it something that you, you kind of deliberately went into kind of looking for some, some way of kind of branching out from doing my, from my life story and the exile inside? Well, I know Clint from from the old days, and so uh, yeah. obviously he was doing quite well. So <laughs> definitely watch yourself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think that um, you know, ten years ago, um, there was a lot of un uncertainty in the music industry, and you know, um, you know, things like um, st streaming. Not that that's been the savior, but you know, it, it just felt like from a, I guess, from a business point of view it felt like a good thing to move into Nick and I both felt like we'd sort of paid our dues a little bit you know we've both been in bands we both toured a lot um and I guess it's a natural it's a it's a natural cycle isn't it you know you you start to you start to fall in love with um you know working in the I mean I love live music I love performing but I also love the the intricacies and the and the focus that working in the studio brings, and obviously writing music for film and TV brings you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you write, when you were writing for for kind of my life story and the, 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 the kind of amalgamations, that obviously kind of comes from you. But when it turns, when it becomes kind of the it, everything's kind of turned on its tables now, if you will. How did you go about that? Is, is that kind of you wait for the filmmakers to contact you and, and kind of give you all the details, or, or, or have you had have you been lucky enough to kind of they've given you a bit of a, kind of a free leash to to kind of decide where you wanted to go based on a few pointers that they've given you? Well, we've always worked with publishers, um, so there's always been a middleman in there, um, and I think one of the things that Nick and I really found interesting was writing to a brief for something that certainly I'd never done before. Um, you know, when you when you come out from your own band, you're, you know, you are the brief, you know, and everybody either likes you or they don't. Um, yeah. Whereas I think the discipline of writing um, music to somebody's imagination is um, is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And but it's equally incredibly satisfying when you do get into someone's head and you are visualizing or you're creating an oral soundscape to what they're hearing. Because obviously it's quite hard for creatives in sync to, to articulate that. Mm -hmm. Was that the same for you, uh, Nick? I'll give you a chance to yeah, speak. Yeah, I think, I mean, um, yeah, I, I think I echo what Jake said, really. I mean, uh, I came from a history of writing a lot of music for myself and there's, there's great things about doing that. Um, there's a freedom to that which is can be freeing and it can be quite debilitating at the same time because you're trying to please yourself which is really difficult um uh, and um so i think when it comes to kind of film music and doing stuff for other people there's a there's 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 something quite nice about the fact there is a kind of framework to work within that has to be adhered to there's something that has to be captured there's something, particularly in film, 
there's a there's a vision that has to be shared with the director you can't just do what you like you have to watch the film understand the characters understand what the, the director's trying to do and then and then within that framework try your best to do what you think is right and um i found that certainly i'm quite quite fun and quite freeing and it just allows you to be more objective i think about the art really rather than trying to kind of write a song going oh god i hope i like this and i hope a million other people like this and whatever you go okay well i've just got to write the best piece of music that really seems to work with this particular scene and that's a lot of a lot of fun yeah and um, a lot of the stuff you've done is is it's been in america i mean i, I was i actually i interviewed um the Bloodfest guys when they were at south by southwest and i had no idea that you'd written the music for that until afterwards that was quite a surprise that you uh, you i mean because because of the kind of the music that you've done you've done previously it was quite a surprise that I, that you'd written um a horror uh, one of the one of the things that you'd go for was a horror horror movie how did you get involved in that and was it was it quite difficult to kind of get into sync with the, the text i think it was a texan director no it was quite hard for me because i'm really squeamish yeah <laughs> <laughs> like that all the time what did they do did they, did they send the film over first or did they kind of send, send you um i don't know the lines or whatever yeah they sent they sent Besides. the film we we had a right we had a good where they were lovely to work with and we had a what was great about that that film was um, we had a conversation on the phone really before anything had happened. Um, we we kind of pitched for a couple of scenes. We scored a couple of scenes out, and that led to a conversation. And it was quite clear from that conversation that we were all on the same page in terms of the the kind of reference points the film was using, old school eighties and seventies slasher horror stuff like you know. Friday the 13th right through to all that all the kind of deeper stuff like the burning with the Rick Wakeman score all these all these all these things are kind of reference points that I I knew really well and and Jake knows well Jake's a huge film music fan as, as well and, and mm -hmm. we 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 both kind of knew really uh what they were after and so we it was a lot of fun to work on it because uh you know if if someone says you know come and be John Carpenter in a studio for for two weeks, I'll do that with pleasure. Uh -huh. I remember that actually one of the one of the tough things about that score was the fact that because it's a comedy as well, yeah. That actually, you know, it's you know you're trying to keep people in suspense. You're trying to keep people, you know, very much involved with all the tropes that you expect in a horror movie. But also, you've got to be really careful not to oversell the gags with the music. It's very, it's, it's there's a, this wonderful scene where they sort of go almost into like a thriller, um, you know, sort of type of Michael Jackson scene where they, they nearly start dancing. And, um, you know, you could have over anticipated that with music. Um, so I seem to remember that that was that was the really re that, that was the really sort of hard thing to do was to try and make sure that we didn't make it too corny because um, yeah. there's plenty of there's plenty of gag visual gags in that film and just sort of back off and actually make the music reasonably serious so that then the gags would become funnier. Yeah, uh -huh. no, exactly. Yeah, I mean, obviously you've done that and you've done a few. Uh, there's a few episodes of different. Uh... TV shows. Have you got anything lined up that you, you're writing for that you have written for that we can, we can hear on, on, on the uh, the TV or the big screen sometime soon? Yeah, we've got a, a lovely trailer out at the moment um, for the BBC um, conversation with friends, which is All right. which, uh, which is on 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 your TVs right now, um, which was a nice thing to do. And um, I mean, that was interesting, Nick, wasn't it? In a way, because when we wrote that, it was it was very much sort of like great, we love it. Um, and this is for a sort of, you know, youth drama. Um, and actually they wanted us to go quite dark with it, almost sort of horror movie-esque, which, um, which is something we've never come across uh, before, have we, Nick? Usually we get asked to make things less dark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's, that it was, um, so yeah, it was quite, it's this particular trailer. It's, uh, it's about kind of, uh, you know, um, the, meand the, the meanderings of kind of four young people who are all very good looking, kind of, you know, they all fancy each other and, you know, chaos ensues. So there's this kind of dark, you know, very dark kind of 
uh, thing that plays out. And um, we, we, we initially did a track which we kind of felt was kind of emotional, emotive, quite sexy. And then they kept coming back saying, can you make it darker? Can you make it darker? And that's, we love doing that. So that wasn't, a, that was easy to do. And uh, it's turned out really well. It works really well in the trailer and it, it, it's, um, it kind of provides a really cool dark backdrop for all the stuff that's happening on screen. So yeah, a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that, that the, this kind of the, the soundtracks that you've been doing that, because it's quite different to what you've written as My Life Story and, and then kind of the other amalgamations, is that something that's kind of channeled into what you're doing on the other, in the band as well? Dancing twilight Really good question. Oh, that's something I, you try to kind of separate. Um, yeah, you sort of do try and separate, but um, you know, obviously, we've we've learned a lot of skills in the studio. Um, and when for for the whole of the sort of so the so my life is sort of half the eighties, all of the nineties, and half the noughties, I was the sole songwriter in the band. So when we uh, released the last my life story album just before lockdown world citizen um you know that was the first time nick and i carried on our composing from choposaurus through to my life story so nick's you know obviously brought a lot lot to the a lot to the table with that and um you know i i, I think that's quite nice i mean my life story always wanted to be sort of i guess bigger and more epic really it was always bigger in my head than what eventually came out you know in the studio and there's only so much you can afford when you're on the dole living in a bed sit, you know, and you've got this grand vision. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I think it just makes, it made natural sense um, to, to involve a little bit of the sort of chopper sort of trailery sound. Um, mm. And uh, I've always loved that sort of amalgamation anyway of, of, as I said earlier, you know, sort of pop and sort of epic strings together has always been my big love. And so chopper sort of just continue that in more in a commercial way than my life story. Mm -hmm. also i think playing? sorry just to add just to, just to add to that it's one of those things also where i think it's important to try although you do as jake says separate things i think it's import, important to try and not overthink the separation so if things do start coming in where it's like this is sounding kind of quite filmic or quite like a soundtrack then that's that's all right you know it's okay mm -hmm. when those it, it's what happens naturally when you do lots of music that or, or when you watch lots of films or whatever you do for your creative pursuits is that stuff that you you just you soak it up and it and it just comes out so uh there there is an important distinction sometimes but what i think jake is very good at tapping in when he when there's my life story stuff that's written he's very good at tapping into a certain headspace that makes it the subject matter unmistakably my life story what happens on top of top of that sonically is something we just let usually just kind of work itself out on its own. We don't try and, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that with this. It just tends to just work quite naturally, which is good. So yeah. I get to, oh, write, I get to write crazy <laughs> lyrics in my life story. I'm not allowed to write stupid lyrics and sing. <laughs> and it's just got to be happy, nice, or scary and dark. <laughs> But I mean, I mean, you said there, Jake, that you, you, when you were in my life story with, with kind of, I think you're like 12 now, and you wanted it to kind of even bigger than, than it was. But I mean, was that, was that a reason why you ended up kind of whittling it down the way you did? Because I mean, I, I think the last time I saw you guys was way back when you released King of Kissing Them on the front, was it a Friday, um, February the 14th on Valentine's Day? That was the last time I saw you. And it was fantastic. That was, for, the, for me, that was, it was just great to see like the whole like orchestra on stage. Was, was, was that something that kind of, you felt like you weren't kind of making the most of in the in the end, and that was why it kind of ended up just kind of you two in the end. No, it was more like a sort of the law of diminishing returns. We uh, are, are we we spent nearly an, uh, well, we spent nine hundred thousand pounds of EMI's money on uh, on string and brass players, harpsichords, celestes, um, you know, recording at Rack Studios, doing you know eighty thousand pound videos. There was a point where it, you know. We'd have to get to sort of, uh, you know, the next five or six singles would have to go to number one for for ten weeks each for us to sort of recoup our money back. So. Uh... And it sounds like an empty house standing still. And it's quieter than a mouse standing still. So 
uh, no, it was more of an economic thing, really. And, um, right. you know, I think that um, as much as I'd love to go, still go around, you know, with a with a, a huge sort of entourage, um, it just felt like, you know, time to maybe just sort of find, fine tune the songs a little bit more. I mean, I think that one of the, if I was to criticise my own stuff back in the day, I think that it was sort of slightly over ambitious in a way. Um, not that there's there's necessarily too wrong with that but I think that with maturity I, I like to with the my life story stuff I like to let the, the songs breathe a little bit more make them a bit more about the the emotion of the song and the lyrics um mm -hmm. and then Nick and I can afford to be a little bit more carefree and uh you know get those sample packs uh, of uh of you know what huge orchestras when we're doing Choposaurus mm -hmm. would you say that was a re one of the reasons why you released the uh, the solo album that you released was kind of like kind of a lot more mellow back version of a lot of the songs that you'd released previously. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, that was a bit like a, um, a a nice sort of way to wind things down and to refocus my own attentions and bring things right back to the songwriting. I mean, ultimately, what Nick and I do are we are we're, we're a Choposaurus are a songwriting company. So you know, Nick and I, um, you know, we 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 write trailers, we write for film, we write for TV, but we also write for other artists, and we. You know, we 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 always start everything we do, even if it's even if it's a, a score for a film, is we start as songwriters. You know, we start with melody, um, and so when yeah, so when I sort of decided to to just put a solo album out, it was very much saying, look, this is me, this is me and a guitar, um, and here are the songs, you know, and here are the lyrics, and you know, it's it's not so sort of. Um, it, it's not um, sh covered in strings, you know, and um, you're not feeling sort of um, hemmed in by the orchestration. So it was just, a, I think, a nice way of just showing um, that I was a songwriter, I suppose. I felt like that was always missed out. People would just talk about strings and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the last album you released as My Life Story came out just pretty much pre-COVID. What's happened since then? I mean, because you've been locked up, um, I imagine you've been hard at work writing songs you know, and preparing some things or anything you can tell us what you've been up to and what what you may be able to uh, release in this in the near future well i keep we keep trying to write my life story stuff but we are we're getting really we're really busy at the moment aren't we um we've had quite a few um we're just working on just bits and bobs at the moment um i think that um I don't know if there's anything really exciting. There's lots of corny stuff we're <laughs> doing, which I don't want to tell you about. <laughs> um, I I did a bit of moonlighting, and um, and uh, I'm the I'm I play I, I sing as a character, uh, an 11 year old boy called Tom Gates, um, uh, in a in a Sky Kids uh, TV show um, about Tom Gates, which is a, a, a big selling uh, book um so yeah i've been uh i've been i've been doing that singing stupid songs for kids but i uh, singing as an 11 year old well what they found was that if they got 11 year old singers in to sing the songs um it you couldn't really quite hear it it wasn't sort of professional enough <laughs> so so uh so yeah they got i don't know why they thought of me you know this gets you know skip yeah so uh yeah, I often when I'm when I'm singing songs about biscuits and um, you know washing the car and things like that, um, I often wonder why they chose me. But there we go. But it's uh, yeah, my daughter absolutely loves it, so I'm a winner there. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, but apart from that, I mean, you said you've not really had a chance to do any my life story stuff, but you are getting back on the road pretty soon. I know you you are supporting the Wonder stuff now. That's one thing that you're yeah. going up soon. Yeah, I'm. I'm funny you mentioned the acoustic thing. I'm. I'm gonna just grab the guitar and 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 go out and support um, Miles and and the gang um, in June um, for pretty much the whole of June, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I met Miles um, when Miles and I are nearly pretty much the same age, and we met each other when we were, I think, twenty um, in Camden at Dingwalls, um, and. Um, yeah, I, I, I put on one of their first ever London shows. I was a very young promoter at the time. And, uh, and we've been friends ever since. And uh, strangely enough, we've, we've only, I think we may have only played together once uh, on the same bill. So uh, I'm looking forward to going out with them. And then 
Uh, Nick and I uh, and the rest of my life story uh, play a couple of shows in July um, with the full band. And then it's, yeah, then I've really got to spend some time trying to write those songs. I mean, they're, they're sort of half written. Uh, we've just, Nick and I've just got to find the time to sort of convert mm -hmm. them in the studio. But I mean, there really is kind of a resurgence of, of the 90s bands right now. A lot of Britpop bands have come back, um, like Shed 7. No, there's quite a few. I want this stuff as well. Would you put that down to anything specifically? Um, well, things do go in cycles. And, yeah. you know, I mean, there was the 80s revival seemed to go on longer than the actual 80s itself. So, um, yeah, I mean, what what would it be? I, I, I think... Um, I think there was, I think there was a lot of great songs in the '90s, um, particularly indie songs, um, and I think that there was a lot of really good showmen and showwomen, um, and I, and and so that will always attract a crowd. Um, I mean, I am looking forward to a noughties revival because there were some great bands in the noughties, um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I can only see it from the perspective of being in the band so it's quite it's quite interesting when you meet all the other bands from that era that you know, may, may not have been so kind to you back in the day and are all sort of all, you know relaxed yeah, that's what and... i was going to say it, it feels I, mean, I've, I've, I usually interview a lot of young bands now and, and there's there's kind of there's no rivalry whatsoever yeah. but right back yeah. in the 90s i can imagine it was really I mean, it just seemed to be like everyone was trying to one-up everyone that was just like a, a constant pissing contest between every every band going at the, at the time no it was and I you know and I speak to artists from the 80s and um you know they say yeah it was you know yeah you you had a little bit of rivalry but it's very friendly um but yeah the night the 90s did seem to be yeah pretty um yeah it's a bit like sort of playground sort of bullies you know and stuff like that but um but no it's it is really nice and it's it's great to it's great to get out there I think you know I think that nostalgia is fantastic as long as it's sort of taken for what it is you know and I think that when we do my life story we're very we're, we're, we're great pains to so when we do a nostalgia show and it's a, a package show with all the other bands we make it literally all about that that's why we're here that's why everyone's there there's no messing around we we, we, be, we we're self-indulgent um you know uh, and the audience are expecting us to play those songs um, but then when we go out on our own you know it's important as well as an artist to be progressive you can't just be stuck in the same kind of on the same area, yeah, so, um, and obviously, you know, I'm lucky enough that we do Choposaurus as well. So from a creative point of view, you know, we, you know, both Nick and I are very fulfilled in that respect. Mm -hmm. And what about, when, I mean, when you go playing live, uh, do you, are they the same fans as always or do they bring their, their kids with them as well now? Because it's, it's kind of my, 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 my kids are about the same age as they get into music as well. And they start to kind of, they like listening to my, my life story. I'm playing them some Shed 7, some stuff that I used to, live to listen to back then. And they, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they they can't wait to go and see concerts with me. Is that is that is that something that you've seen when you go playing live? Yeah, exactly. And I think that you know, I suppose my life story regarded regarded as a bit of a cult band. So, um, you know, our fans are, you know, yeah, it's that sort of family environment um, at a gig anyway, at a my life story gig. So, yeah, it 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 just makes sense that they would bring their their kids along. And um, yeah, it's 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 really amazing. Actually, it's really great to see. And also, you know, it saves on the babysitters, doesn't it? Things like that. You might as well just bring everyone out with you. <laughs> well, that's really, I don't want to queue you anymore, Tony. I really appreciate uh, speaking to you. I uh, wish you the best of luck with uh, whatever comes next, because I know you said you've, you've not really got anything specific set up just yet, but I hope we can uh, hear a My Life Story or Chopper Souls really sometime soon. And I, uh, I hope, to, hope to see you at a, a, live, a live gig sometime soon as well. Absolutely, Howard. Always, yeah. All the best. All right. Cheers. Thanks very much for speaking to me. Cheers, guys. Take care. Right. Bye then. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Cheers. Bye.